Hello, once again, I am Peter Woodbury with Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce. Today we'll be speaking live with Hugh Newman from his home just a stone's throw from Stonehenge. He is a self-declared megalithomaniac, a researcher of ancient mysteries, a frequent speaker here at the Edgar Cayce Center, and also a researcher of the giants of North America. So join me in this conversation with Mr. Hugh Newman. So Hugh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah, that's great to be here. Yeah, and are you uh, are you coming to us from England? Are you in? Yeah, yeah, I'm currently in England, currently at home. Uh, I live uh, surprisingly close to Stonehenge, so oh, um, okay. in the, the heartland of southern England on Salisbury Plain. Oh, okay, okay. Is that by chance that you live so close to Stonehenge? Oh, no, I made it that way. Uh, it was uh, purely uh, intentional. <laughs> Do they have a picture of you at Stonehenge, like a warning to all the staff? You know, if you see this man climbing fences. <laughs> I'm sure in the near future that there might be, yeah. So uh, let's wait and see. <laughs> now, do you, uh, do you lead tours of Stonehenge or do you do any ceremonies there? Yeah, yeah, we do a bit of all that kind of stuff. We uh -huh. do regular trips there. We run tours. We, we we run the Megalithomania Conference in Glastonbury, but we bring tour groups to there. Uh, we have people stay here. We just had Michael Tellinger here. He's like a well-known kind of author and explorer. He's been here for a few days. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a nice little base. Oh, that's explore. great. That's great. It's kind of like I live 10 blocks from the ARE, so I, we, we kind of share that in common. Yeah, that's useful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get um, interested? I mean, you're a self-declared megalithomaniac. How did that? How did that get started? That's correct. Yeah, but megalithomaniac. That is exactly what I am. But this, this really, we'll just give give a bit of background. That name comes from the book Megalithomania, by John Michelle that came out in 1982. Uh -huh. It was about artists, antiquarians, archaeologists getting excited and blown away and obsessive about the big stone monuments. And mm -hmm. that's really where that's really why we set up the conference with the same name back in 2006. Um, to bridge this gap between academia and the alternative world uh, to explore these mysteries yeah and and, I, and, I, and I'm just that that's just you know I'm just a megalithomaniac I'm constantly exploring traveling as much as possible writing making videos everything uh -huh. else about these particular sites and and uh, and in recent years it's been a lot of revelations uh, a few new discoveries just by you know taking the extra going the extra mile to actually spend more time at these sites look in places you're not supposed to look mm -hmm. and, uh, and take it from that perspective but also I'm, I'm kind of interested in other things there's like uh mainly landscape mysteries there's the crop circles because mm -hmm. i live right in the heart of the crop where the crop circles appear i've been studying yeah. those for 20 or more years yeah and um and a few other things, you know, I've, I've written books about the giant skeletons of North America with Jim Vieira, who spoke at your event last year, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's all these different aspects kind of blend into one, uh, you, know, re, you know, constant research of the of the ancient landscape. Yeah. And how did that start for you? Do you, do you remember, like, what did you read a book or did you did you watch a show? How did that get sparked for you? Well, when I was a kid, we used to. My mum uh, used to subscribe to a magazine called The Unexplained, ah. which was which came every every month or every few weeks, and uh -huh. it's like a fourteen kind of magazine. Everything you could, all the unexplained kind of X Files type stuff, and I was constantly reading that. It was blowing my mind. Uh -huh. And then when I, when I was young, I was in my early twenties, I guess. Um, I was quite interested in all the alien stuff and then the uh, UFOs and such mysteries. And then I, I visited a crop circle with my brother and it just blew us away. About how old like, were you? I was in my early 20s. Oh. I, can't remember, I can't remember exactly. Um, and it was, quite, it was quite a revelation to sort of see these mysteries in the fields occurring in my own country. So we started investigating it thoroughly. Yeah. Um, and then that kind of got me into the ancient mysteries and the ancient landscape because that's where all the crop circles are, always yeah. near ancient sites. Uh -huh. Kind of drew me into that world, you know, looking at the geometry, the the ancient uh, metrology and the, the mysteries and earth energies and things like this. What what are your thoughts about the crop circles? Like what are they what are they about or what are they communicating? Well, they're, they're, they're one of the strangest phenomena to happen on the planet ever, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, 
And uh, for those that are listening, if, if they think it's just a bunch of blokes with planks after the pub uh, having fun. I don't think we have many of those watching our no, shows. <laughs> but, but that's good. Thank you. Good. And, uh, and you know, the thing is, there's a prehistory of crop circles, which, mm -hmm. which really interests me that if you look into historical record, you find references to them go back hundreds, possibly thousands of years. And that fascinates me. Yeah. And so that to me, that, that gives it clarity and it gives it a reality that they're not all man-made just to yeah. clear that up yeah. once and for all um so if that is the case then what on earth are they that, that's what you've got to ask and mm -hmm. the fact you're finding very intricate geometry you're finding incredibly sophisticated number systems or you know ancient metrology numbers even you're finding um you know, optical illusions you're finding the way they are placed in the landscape in relation to each other and to ancient sites they're encoding very strange and possibly very high level information mm -hmm. and in fact some of the geometry even in the earlier circles back in the 1980s even though it looked quite simple they were encoding how to square the circle which has been the bane of geometers for years for decades mm -hmm. in the hundreds of years and so there's the fact that you're finding that in quite simple con constructions of these circles and the more complicated ones you're finding other things other extremely sophisticated uh, geometry systems that haven't been uh, even thought about by modern humans mm -hmm. it's mind-blowing so if it is a communication, it's a very gentle and a very long-term communication with whoever's making them. It could mm -hmm. be Gaia, it could be like the Earth, it could be the elemental realm, the fairies, the sprites, the mm -hmm. elves, all this kind of stuff, which is, you know, I believe is a, is a reality and it's still, mm -hmm. traditions of those are still strong and they're always connected with these kind of phenomena. Oh, it could be, you know, just alien intelligences from other star systems or even other dimensions. Um, and so we have to kind of, you know, carefully consider this but i think fundamentally it's just a case of observing them uh, appreciating them and just you know allowing them into your life mm -hmm. is the first step you don't mm -hmm. have to understand them all you don't have to get it you don't have to kind of right. work out all the all this geometry the metrology or the mathematics you can just appreciate them for their divine geometrical beauty yeah. i think that is the key that is the key to like true communication yeah whether it just be with you know a design or whether it be an actual language so yeah. i think i think you know as we know as you you know people at the are know you know the, the fundamental universal language that that stretches through all time and space is mathematics and geometry yeah and so the fact that they come in these forms does suggest that it's it's a it's a communication through time space and dimensions and, and it's always the same you can't yes. deny it's always the same everyone can read it the same way yes and it, it seems that it communicates with something deeper than your conscious mind there's like an unconscious kind of triggering that's right yeah i think i think that's the thing i think that's why it's just a case of appreciating them don't yeah. dismiss them don't throw them out don't you know don't just you know dismiss them as hoaxes just appreciate them because i think there's something there yeah and it's in nowadays you have to decipher which ones are man-made and hoaxes yeah which ones are not um and but even the man-made ones are, are remarkable and yeah. there's some remarkable people constructing them now has that has anybody ever happened upon kind of a non-man-made uh, one happening has anyone ever experienced whatever is going on that that creates these yeah there's, there's a couple of accounts one of them was filmed in 1996 uh -huh. at oliver's castle in wiltshire uh, and actually saw these three or four balls of light you know about the size about this size moving around uh -huh. in a circle and forming a crop circle like uh -huh. full of flop, crop flattening as they move around in uh -huh. a few seconds uh -huh. friend gary king witnessed uh, the 777 uh, formation in 2007. Um, he was filming this field all night with some uh, with some other people, and there was a huge flash of light. And then, when eventually the sun rose, there was this massive crop circle there. Um, so there's things like this. There's been eyewitness accounts. There's been balls of light have been filmed and recorded. Um, there's been people who believe they've created them with intentions and with their own minds. Um, so yeah, it's definitely one of those um, one of those unusual, unexplained phenomena, which is still unexplained. One of my favorite uh, kind of new age humorous stories was um, John Van Auken led a tour to England, and he was called and told there was a, a crop circle that had just uh, appeared, and so the tour group went, but. It was a wheat crop circle, and so someone on the tour said, "Well, I'm, I'm uh, gluten intolerant. Could we find a corn crop circle or barley?" 
I always love that story. That's a good one. I like that. It's a good, 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 good anecdote or slash joke. Yeah. <laughs> but but you got to have a sense of humor in the in the new age. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just uh, continuing with the. Uh, so what was the first uh, megalith that you visited? I assume you've been to the pyramids and to Machu Picchu and all these places. Yeah, yeah, I get around a bit. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, do a lot of traveling. But yeah, the first megalith I really visited, that I can remember, um, was probably um, local ones to where, where I was from in, in Cambridge because mm -hmm. there, there are a few scattered around there. Um, but I know that, for instance, which is quite a strange story, that my mum and dad, when, they, when my mum was pregnant with me, we just, they drove around in the camper van to all the megalithic sites for ah. some reason. Oh. And um, and uh, one morning they woke up next to Silbury Hill because uh, I was kicking so hard uh, oh. they pulled over to get a night's sleep. <laughs> they woke up next to Silbury Hill, oh. right in the heart of the Avebury landscape. So I don't know if you can call that the first megalithic site oh. I went to, but I see. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, yeah. So so, um, so you share that with your parents. So your parents were interested in ancient cultures yeah, and that. I I think they were a little bit, yeah. Especially yeah. my mum, she yeah. was she's very interested in, in, in the alternative way of thinking. Uh, I mean, she's been doing yoga for forty years and been a vegetarian for thirty years. Oh, okay. she's, it's these alternative ways of living, and uh, so yeah, so that was a useful, useful kind of uh, upbringing in that in that respect. Have you ever had any uh, like ever done a past life regression or had dreams where you you see yourself in the past as part of these structures or anything with that? Not so much, but I'm sure if I come to the ARE, that might happen to me. Uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, we have, not, we, have this past, so we have this past life Kool-Aid that you can drink and you'll, <laughs> you'll see all well, kinds I've had, of things. I've had, I've had people tell me that I've been certain things in past lives. Oh, but, okay. But none of it uh, resonates so much yet. Not, not, not quite. Not yeah. quite yet. We'll, oh, okay. we'll see. Oh, good. It's, it's always nice to meet someone in the new age who's a little bit skeptical. That's kind of nice. <laughs> it's refreshing. <laughs> um, now, earlier you mentioned uh, the giants that you and another fellow had researched. You know, Edgar Cayce gave readings about those people. Um, any, any more thoughts about that, about what was, what was going on then that, that people were so tall? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, we, we mentioned Edgar Casey in our book. Uh -huh. um, it's quite a large chunk of it in our in our in a couple of chapters. We look at mystics and uh, and uh, alternative thinkers, and also in the final chapter, because he was talking about not only the, you know the giants of Atlantis and things like this. He was also mm -hmm. talking about giants in North America, mm -hmm. you know, and that really compelled us because yeah. we didn't realize some of his more obscure readings talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually correlates strangely closely with the discoveries we've made. Mm -hmm. So Vieira is my co-author, is very much into Edgar Cayce. He's, mm -hmm. a, he's a real follower and I've been I've been aware of, you know, the whole Edgar Cayce thing for many, many years. Um, so to find that correlation, we found quite interesting. Uh, and I'll be bringing that up at the conference, when I, when, you know, and why that is quite important. The fact that he was picking up on this really before it was known about publicly that mm -hmm. there were these discoveries being made. They were, they were being made at the time Edgar Casey was around mm -hmm. doing these readings, mm -hmm. strangely, and before that and after that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there's so many accounts, we actual physical accounts of giant skeletons and bones being dug up across the whole of North America. We've got something like 1,500 accounts, mm -hmm. 1,500. We only featured 250 in the book, so we could squeeze into 400 pages. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a remarkable cover-up, you know, the way it's all been covered up so meticulously since they were being discovered right up until the present day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all very subtle. It's all very carefully covered up and ridiculed. But the fact that we're having a whole period of human history uh, deleted from the record is something that bugged me and Jim very much. And uh, so we decided to put this book together. While we were doing the book, we got offered to do a TV show for History Channel. So we did a six part show called Search for the Lost Giants, which unfortunately got canceled after six shows, but we're wow. looking at doing some more uh -huh. on this subject. So we feel it's a very important subject. And uh, we've spread that around the world a bit. We're now working on a book about the British giants uh, and, and finding some remarkable things here. Uh -huh. uh, and again, it's been a, it's been a cover up. Um, 
and so this is the, this is this is the issue we have really with it when something's covered up so meticulously and all the legends state this is a reality and then all the discoveries in the historical record we're talking about academic journals mm -hmm. smithsonian's own annual reports even though they then covered it up has 17 accounts of see, seven and eight foot tall skeletons i mean that's that's the lower range of the ones we're dealing with we have up to 14 or 18 feet tall mm -hmm. uh, some of the accounts and so it's just one of these interesting facets of the ancient mysteries because they're always connected with the megalithic sites with mm. the construction of the megalithic ah. sites the earthworks the hill forts and uh, they always built in what, what are called high places mm -hmm. we even get the same stories in the bible in the, in the old testament and things like this mm -hmm. talking about these uh, biblical giants so it's, it's a genuine phenomenon there a genuine um part of history that that needs to be addressed yeah. uh, and uh, we're part of that process. Yeah, so it sounds like you're uh, invested in, in the untold stories, kind of the untold yes. parts of history and then the, the kind of um, trying to help people understand the purposes of the megalithic structures and, and kind of what, or the, or the crop circles and kind of what they're offering us at this time. Do you have more thoughts about that? I mean, uh, you know, here at the ARE, we're very, uh, you know, Casey gave readings about the, the transition into this new age and a kind of awakening. What do you see in your work that's part of, uh, is there something that you think human consciousness is, is kind of ready to awaken to or is, is important to awaken to? Yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think just, you know, when uh, I'm taking it from the perspective of just the research I've been doing, mm -hmm. um, just with these giants, for example, I mean, the fact that it's been so meticulously covered up um, is 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 a, is quite enlightening and quite shocking, and people can't can't handle it when you tell them this and you show them all the evidence. It's almost like, well, that can't be true because I was taught that at school. I have not seen that on TV. Yeah, how can that be? And so, so once you start going down the rabbit hole, you keep going further and you keep going further, and more things come up, stranger things come up, and this is the case with things like this. The crop circles are another one. They really are potentially, you know. We're always looking for, you know, how do we communicate with otherworldly beings mm -hmm. and why, why are they getting back to us? And they are. They have been for 100 years. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been doing it in the fields of England, for mm -hmm. God's sake. And yeah. so the fact that you've got this, it's, you know, if people just look a bit deeper, they go beyond, but underneath what the media are telling us, underneath, start digging into the, you know, the alternative records even the academic records that have been squashed under and just in dusty old museums and libraries you start uncovering things and um and a combination with exploring and traveling from my perspective uh it's amazing what you can discover you know if you just push you know push past what is on the internet especially what other people have written about in the last 20 or 30 years you go be, go beyond that you look into the old records the old books you go and look to the sites yourselves you get your own photos you do your yeah. own digging and things like this that's where that's when it all changes but so many people like 99 percent of researchers and writers are just you know saying what other people have said and it becomes a frustrating yeah. kind of journey when you're looking you're looking for a deeper understanding yeah. and i think you know with you know with the, i've been involved in the alternative um kind of scene for a while the new age scene the the health i used to study nutrition and things mm -hmm. like this uh, naturopathic nutrition and uh, body work healing modalities and so forth so i'm, I'm very aware of that and um and the fact that we, you know, one of the other aspects worth mentioning here, that which is um, very important, is this idea of earth energies. Now, it sounds like a kind of new agey idea mm -hmm. about yeah. megalithic sites, but actually there's some really good science done on that now by people like John Burke. Catch Halberger wrote the book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. Mm -hmm. Philip Callahan in the 70s and 80s and other researchers realizing, now proving scientifically, that these ancient sites manipulated natural earth energy currents and you can actually if you go to the sites now and you place some seeds there or grains it will charge them up in a certain way uh -huh. so when you go and plant the grains and seeds you get a much higher yield a better quality crop and uh -huh. more abundant abundant food uh so this was one of the secrets of the ancients but the same energy this sort of natural you know, this uh, natural magnetic telluric energy would affect your consciousness mm -hmm. 
give you altered states and mm -hmm. uh, visionary experiences. And so we have to that is that that is coming to light now that these ancient sites and these ancient people had a very high understanding of, mm -hmm. of very very advanced technology, yeah. but not the way we see technology today. It was an earthly nature technology. Yeah, uh, this is something I really emphasize in all my talks and my writings and, thing, right, and things like this because that's something that could change the world because it could replace. You know, people could understand how this works. It could replace the whole GM crop problem. It could replace mm -hmm. all, you know, any problems of famine, starvation, yeah. and uh, foods not growing properly and things mm -hmm. like this. So, so there's there's a lot going on mm -hmm. uh, in this current paradigm that that needs more attention. Yeah, and there's plenty of uh, Casey readings that would support what you just said. So I remember um, I led a tour to Guatemala, and Casey talked about the fire stones, these stones that had been charged with physical and spiritual energies, where he actually described angelic beings would work with people that were, in a way, purifying on these yeah. stones. And we did a ceremony there. And, um, you know, I'm as much as I do this kind of stuff, I'm not an energy sense guy. I don't walk in places and pick up stuff. So I'm kind of energy dense but that experience really felt profound for me that just the the clearing or whatever it was like I feel that I'm I shifted something in that in that energy field and for, for the better in a positive way yeah and I, I, I agree I think these sites you know that they're designed from a very high level perspective they're like they're not they're choosing places to put them on the earth which are power spots which are potentially portals they're kind of something special and liminal kind of space like a mm -hmm. sacred sanctified space naturally mm -hmm. and then they build upon that and then work around that and then they sort of sort of, sort of bring it in in a certain way and then you have the human interaction with it and you can, it can have a profound effect and it can affect you know spread across the planet spread through consciousness and i think um i think that the you know the there's a there's a reality to all these ceremonies yeah. uh, and tribal societies and the way they operate it's something in it that science is starting to catch up with yeah and it it seems that i mean it, like you're saying the repression of this kind of information at least in in the united states there seems to be a bit of an opening because I've seen I think it's just in the last few months that the, the US government has acknowledged their program on, on aliens that they were studying that and they've allowed some of the uh, video and some of the audio and some of the people the military people to talk about it which is a big shift because you used to have you were sworn to not be after you left the military never to talk about any of these experiences so it seems that i guess it's reached critical mass that they're feeling that that they have to in some way begin to uh to discuss that yeah i think it's uh, i mean i i, 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 there's, I think there's that their reasoning for not bringing it out to the public because there'll be a worldwide panic mm -hmm. um and there might well be <laughs> and uh, so we have to kind of you know be aware that that, that could well, be the a, case what was that that show that they had a radio show back when when people believed orson wells did the aliens were landing and everybody went crazy yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i mean i mean you could imagine there would be a bit of a panic and uh, <laughs> And it would change people's realities overnight and so you can understand i can understand that there's a reason for that why they cover certain things up um but not others obviously but but that you know i think uh i mean i would i would be slightly concerned if they suddenly announced yes aliens are here deal with it you know you, you, you've got like what you know oh they're invisible they're around you every day what <laughs> so so you gotta like um you know <laughs> consider that as well break, I think, break uh, people right. in slowly I think, yeah, have Steven yeah, Spielberg it, make a movie or two. And yeah. people softened up. Yeah, people are used to it, and then there's nice aliens as well. So uh, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. You know, I know that um, you know Edgar Casey, when he gave his readings, there was he would talk about people's past lifetimes, and twice he made reference to the person being around where there was apparently a visitation from other worlds, but there was no follow up that you know it's like even now you think Edgar Casey's giving this stuff and it was almost like you you wonder it must have been that this was too far out there like they were dealing with reincarnation they were dealing with astrology they said oh we're not going to go into aliens so they didn't they just you know, it was mentioned twice and as you read it you go god why didn't they follow up but i think it's like you're saying you know it's difficult to shift paradigms and history is not kind to the paradigm shifters 
And so I think that, that that's kind of what, what you've been up against is you're trying to, to talk about aliens and you're, talk, you're trying to talk about uh, crop circles and, and giants. You know, it, it, it's almost like ego, like, oh, we're going to have to rewrite our history books. And it's, it's easier not to rewrite the history books. So let's just suppress you instead of having to shift paradigms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the nature of you know uncovering uh, uncomfortable truths. Yeah. You know, um, and the and to be honest with you, I mean, you look around the world today. I mean, with all the traveling I've been doing, you see, you know, you see remnants of lost civilizations in places where it's not being recorded mm -hmm. that anyone was even there, um, and that blows me away. It's a bit like the way that the giants or the aliens are kind of kept quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, re the reasoning for that I find very strange. I mean, I've just been to Italy, for instance. Uh, I've been traveling in Sardinia, the Mediterranean. Um, and there's a whole megalithic culture there that goes way back before the Romans, before the Etruscans. And it's remarkable. And there's, you get the same kind of megalithic technologies you do in ancient Peru, like the massive polygonal walls there. Mm -hmm. And there's no nothing. There's literally nothing about it has been written mm -hmm. or researched, apart from one person I know and one person in Italy and someone an antiquarian in the mid 1800s that's it mm -hmm. and like and you're like hang on a sec this is like stunning we've been to all these sites and they're mind-blowing so it's up to you know it's up to individuals to kind of you know push forward with things and yeah. you know bring things out to the public to um you know wake them up to watch just around them yeah. what's beneath their feet and, and you know i i uh, i have great respect for science you know i think that it's a uh, it's a powerful tool but sometimes you get almost fundamentalist scientists that, that don't want to go with the information. They want to go, or with the data, they want to go with their bias. You know, if you look at, like, you know, the, the thing about how the pyramids were built, to think that, that people, slaves or whatever, were lifting these hundred of ton stones, what is it, 30 stories up in, in the air, that they were doing that with pulleys, it, it, it doesn't, it defies logic. I mean, science could find some other possible reason for that, but just the one that seems to be traditional just doesn't seem to make any sense. Well, that's, that's the issue, I think. I mean, uh, nowadays, everyone has noticed this, that the only voice of ancient sites is archaeologists mm -hmm. for some reason. Why is it only archaeologists who are the sole voice speaking on behalf of Stonehenge, the pyramids, Machu Picchu, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Where are the geomancers, the dowsers? Where are the the visionaries, the mm -hmm. psychics? Where are the um, you know people with all these different disciplines? The yes. people who study sacred geometry, archaeoacoustics, other things like this. Why do, why is the only voice and the only voice people accept yeah. in the media and in the mainstream? Arche all archaeologists do is dig things up. <laughs> <laughs> and record what's there that's it i mean no disrespect to them they do really hard work yeah they do really struggling hard work in the rain bad hours the blistering sun right ridiculous and i respect them for the, for the amazing work that many of them do but for them to be the sole voice of the megalithic sites yeah. is that's a very great point. unbalanced and it's and it's a sign of what's wrong with society the way science is the only voice of reality yeah it's just not correct, and I and I think this is the balance is all wrong, and yeah. I think that, that that that's what's slowly, very slowly changing, um, and this is the whole you know this whole awakening that's potentially yeah. taking place. This is part of you know shifting that balance. I mean, it, just to put it you know simple layman so with this conference we do the megalithomania, we deliberately invite academics and archaeologists to come and speak at our conference, and we invite the extremely out there stuff as well because yeah. everything's you know we, we you know we we you know filter them to make sure they're not complete nutters and things like this you know they're they're, they're sane and stuff but you know we, we bring it together and that creates this amazing energy and like everyone's on an equal plateau at equal kind of standing and to discuss the sites you know because i know people who spent more years researching megalithic sites and they're not archaeologists and archaeologists have yeah. And yet they become the sole voice. So this this is frustrating. This is why I, I sort of hark back to the 1800s. And there was an era of antiquarians, they're called, where these people like William Stukeley, John Aubrey, uh, George Dennis, when, when you're looking at ancient Italy and people like this, were out there exploring, writing about sites, illustrating, mapping them, digging a little bit and all this kind of stuff. Because they just did it and they did. They paid for it themselves. They had no funding, did it all off their own back loved it and and made it their life and yet they get dismissed 
Yes. Someone who's done one archaeology degree and has dug two sites in their life, you know. And so th th this is this is my point. This is where I get well, frustrated. It's a, yes, it's a, it's an excellent point because you could. It's like when you have a, a laboratory, the people that do that administer the experiment, they aren't the ones that interpret the data. You know, it's yes. like the the archaeologists create data, and that data becomes open to interpretation in lots of disciplines. And so what you're saying is that the the, the data gatherers become the interpreters, which which wouldn't hold water in any other field. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, this is uh, you know, in, in many of the fields I've you know I've been looking into and things like this. It's like, um, um, I mean, you look at people like Michael Crimo who got um, got ridiculed, and and people he knows who find these millions of year old, billions of year old human fossils and things mm -hmm. like this, and get completely discredited, lose all their uh, lose all their kind of university. Yeah you know places and things like this and so this is what happens and it's like hang on a sec it's just it's all just a bit gone a bit wrong really. yeah and uh and so i get frustrated when people say oh well you're not an academic how can you possibly comment on stonehenge <laughs> i said well it's, it's, it's my life you know, i'm an <laughs> antiquarian this is what yeah. i love you know this is what i do and i think this is this is where you know you know things like the place like the are and, and the groups i'm involved with it's really useful, you know, that you've got, you have, a, you know, you get different disciplines coming in and discussing. Yeah. Well, you're, it's a platform and, and your platform is reaching more and more people. It's kind of, it's resonating with folks. Well, the, the time has kind of flown by, but is there anything um, you'd like to cover? Anything we haven't covered you'd like to speak to? I know you'll be back again here soon at the Ancient Mysteries Conference. Anything you'd like to, uh, to close with that we haven't covered? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of things I could, I could get into, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think it's just a case of, you know, uh, when it comes to ancient sites, I think I do encourage people if they can go and visit some, if you're in, if you're in, uh, America, there's a surprising amount of ancient sites there mm -hmm. in New England. This is where Jim Vieira lives hundreds of megalithic sites. There's mm -hmm. Gunji Womp, there's America Stonehenge, there's North Salem Dolman, New York state going to the you know the the mississippi uh, up to the ohio valley you've got all the male culture sites the amazing museums and artifacts that have been discovered you go to california the shell mounds there's all the petroglyph sites in nevada and arizona and it, you know i think you know if you're gonna if you want to get a sense of the ancient sites you have to go try and go to them even if they're local and if you, you know, if people want to come to England, get in touch with me. I'll take you to Stonehenge. We can walk there. Yeah. Um, you know, and <laughs> so, you, know, but, you can literally walk there from your house. Literally walk wow. there, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so it's like, you know, this is, you know, so I think it's important. And I encourage people to do that, whatever position you're in, financially or whatever, you know, anything. Just, just make a little bit of effort. Just go out for a weekend, you know, and even if you have to go camping. Yeah. And I think. Or, you know, you get a really different sense of like how the ancients would have lived when you're out in the wilderness, yeah. you see inside this stone circle or this petroglyph site, the sun sets, the stars come out, and you suddenly realize that that's how the ancients were living. They were observing the stars. That was their TV. That was their internet. And so, you know, you can imagine how different it was and how clear the mind is and how, you know, you're completely present and you're your intuition is at a heightened level. And I think that that's important, you know, just to get to ancient sites and to feel the energies and to, you know, touch the stones. And um, I encourage people to do that, whether it's come, come and join me here or anywhere, we go out, you know, with members, little groups, the ARE, highly recommend it. Oh, great, good, good. Well, that's a great uh, point to uh, end on. Well, I've enjoyed our conversation. We could have gone on for much longer, but thank you for your time. And I hope I get to see you next time you're here. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day.